guys, you're listening to Totally Stoked Podcast with Amelia Travis, yoga teacher and wild child turned multi six figure business coach, writer, speaker, and spiritual warrior. Totally Stoked is an experiment in radical honesty. On this show, there's only two rules show up and tell the truth. Each week, we share uncensored, truth telling, shame busting conversations with thought leaders, entrepreneurs, visionaries, and modern day mystics revealing their rise to thrive stories, current challenges, and sharing their most powerful tools for awakening, growth, and well-being. This is your place to let down your guard, open your heart, and remember that being human is a crazy, wild ride, but you don't have to do it alone. So buckle up, baby, because we're heading full speed ahead to radical self-love and a totally stoked life. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Welcome back to another episode of Totally Stoked Podcast. I'm so excited to share today's topic with you. It's something that is a part of my own past and very near and dear to my heart. My guest today is a licensed therapist, energy worker, and award-winning speaker who has helped hundreds of individuals improve their mental and emotional health through a holistic approach that fuses traditional and energetic therapeutic modalities. She's certified in emotional freedom technique, the emotion code, and is a Reiki master. She's serving as the director of behavioral health at Premier Fitness Camp and formerly directed the treatment program for binge eating disorder at UCSD Center for Healthy Eating Activity Research. This woman specializes in the treatment of food and eating issues, offering online group programs, one-on-one coaching for recovery from bulimia and similar disordered eating, as well as therapeutic energy work. Her passion and purpose stem from her own life experience, and here today to share her story of finding freedom after disordered eating is my dear friend and brilliant colleague, Sarah Spears. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to, to be here and be able to talk with you. Yes. Thank you for taking the time to do this. So um, we know each other through a friend. We have a mutual friend and we've known each other for a couple of years, but only in, I would say the past year, we're able to sit down and have dinner and really see that, oh my gosh, we have so much in common from both our past and our present from a really challenging past of disordered eating and addiction issues and and, um, emotional bondage, I would say, and then moving into Uh, not just our own healing, but being in the path of service to help other people find liberation from these really challenging issues. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm super inspired by, by you. And I love to see, um, your growth as a spiritual teacher, because I feel like it's been Mm -hmm. really explosive in the past just time that I've known you of you to offering more energy work and and transformative healing practices. It's true. And, and that's sort of, been fun for me to experience is as I continue to heal and serve other people, the, just the amount of how important it is to acknowledge the spiritual aspect of, of healing and recovery, because that's often a missing piece for most of us. So, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, um, what you currently do. You're the director of behavioral health at Mm -hmm. premier fitness camp, and you specialize in helping people recover from binge eating, bulimia, and other disordered eating. So I think a lot of times people just, especially if they don't have any personal experience with it, they think that uh, these kinds of food-related issues are like very much physical issues. You know what I mean? Too many calories in, too few calories out, or too few calories in and too many calories out. And what you're here to say is like, there's a lot more going on than that. Way more. It is so much more complex than just food. And anybody who is dealing with an eating issue will know the more you try to control food, because we think that's, that's the solution. Usually the worse it gets. Um, That was certainly my experience, and it took me um, eight years of struggling with bulimia to start to realize what was actually underlying my my battle with food, eating, and my body. Well, I have to take a big, deep breath after you say that, because (laughs) as I sit here, and you know, this is something I've shared um, about in a few different arenas, sexual trauma, drug addiction, and disordered eating. All of these are a big part of my own story. And with none of them, did I ever actually 
uh, address them. I mean, I went to a ther- I went to therapy for a while, but yep. um, in my actual path of finding freedom from them, I didn't ever really do it. What I'm putting in quotes as like the right way or like go get the yeah. help. And what I'm realizing now at 34 is, oh my gosh, I have all of this work to do, right? Because the yes. underlying issues though they may not be manifesting right now in symptoms, the underlying issues are still there, right? So exactly it's like this, emo- this trauma that's been stored in our body and then we find coping mechanisms. And yep. for me, one coping mechanism was anorexia or yes. food restriction um, yep. and over-exercising. Another coping mechanism was promiscuity or using sex to yep. self-medicate. Another one was, um, you know, substance abuse. So I would love to hear, because you just said, you know, eight years of bulimia. Um, This is very rooted in your own life experience. Mm -hmm. So would you share with us a little bit about your history um, and your experience with bulimia and just your background that got you to where you are? Sure. You know, it's really interesting, my story, because I didn't have any issues with eating most of my life as a child, teen, even in college, like I would consider myself a normal eater, ate what I wanted to eat, didn't think about it. And then I moved from New York to California and I got a job at a weight loss and fitness camp and decided I just wanna be as healthy as I can. So I did a little bit of research and decided I'm gonna try a vegan diet. And I will say right now, I'm not commenting on whether or not someone should do a vegan diet. I think (laughs) different diets work for different people. I'm saying I didn't do my research properly. And I just thought that meant don't eat animal products. And the camp had a no fat, low fat diet. So we didn't have like nuts or seeds. And so as a result, I basically was just eating fruits and vegetables Mm -hmm. for the summer while exercising throughout the day with campers and not getting nearly enough calories, probably like 800 calories a day. So the result of that at the end of the summer is I weighed about 95 pounds, um, kind of just wasted away slowly. How which tall ha- are you? Five, four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was pretty tiny and that hadn't been my intention. Like I didn't weigh myself once the whole summer. I wasn't striving to lose weight. I just wanted to be healthy is what I told myself. And a lot of times disordered eating will hide under the mask of I'm being healthy right? Uh, Cutting out food groups because they're unhealthy or I'm following a diet because it's healthy. And that can very quickly be a slippery slope that leads into what I experienced, which was basically this obsessive compulsive nature around food. I had the longest list of food rules and was so hyper-focused on everything I eat and having to meet those food rules. I could eat almonds, but they had to be soaked and sprouted and dehydrated and things had to be organic. And so what happened when I left camp was actually two things. Um, The first was I had no idea how to feed myself because the whole summer I had just been eating what the camp served me, fruits and vegetables. And I suddenly found myself in a supermarket, like overcome with panic because I was reading tons of food labels and nothing was matching the rules that I had created. And so I'd leave with a banana and not know what to eat, which was crazy at 25 to suddenly like you go from eating no problem your whole life to literally not knowing how to feed yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the same time, I also had um, moved from New York to California. Like I said, I packed my whole life in my car And the night that I got out of camp and I moved into my sublet, I went to bed and I came out the next day to unpack all my stuff and my car was gone. Oh no. And so literally everything, my entire life was just stolen. The very first night that I was moving um, into my, like basically my first day in San Diego. And so it was pretty traumatic because I didn't, identify with my physical body anymore because I was so skinny and I no longer had my physical belongings and I didn't realize how much my identity had been attached to both the physical body and physical possessions and so that was kind of the the traumatic event that I couldn't cope with but I didn't know it at the time and Mm -hmm. so because my body was literally starving and I was so emotionally overwhelmed I started to binge Mm -hmm. and then I would tell myself 
because I'm binging tomorrow, I'm going to be good. So I'm going to fast or I'm going to just eat fruits. And then because my body is starting starving, I would binge again. And it just led to this binge restrict cycle. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I went to Mexican food and I could not stop eating the chips and guacamole and then the beans and the enchiladas. And before I knew it, I literally felt like the food was just at the top of my throat. Like I was mm -hmm. so sick to my stomach. I couldn't fit in anymore. And I went to the bathroom and I threw it up and I felt so much better. It was like this wave of relief and I had undone the, the bad mm -hmm. eating and I just felt so much better. And so pretty quickly it spiraled into binging and purging. And after a few months, pretty much any time I ate, I would throw it up um, or go out of my way to get food. And, you know, four or five, sometimes 10 times a day, just engaging in this pattern. Mm -hmm. And I remember sort of the turning point for me was one night when I went and got an entire pizza and a gallon of ice cream and I forced it down my throat, hating myself every single bite and was determined to throw it all up. And a piece of the pizza crust got lodged in my throat mm -hmm. and I started choking. Mm -hmm. And I literally in that moment thought somebody is going to walk into my apartment and find me dead next to these empty food boxes with a puke stained toilet. And that is going to be like my obituary, you know? And that was the moment where I, I vowed I will heal myself of this because I refuse to let this be the rest of my life. And then I'm going to help women and men who are suffering do the same because I did not want anyone to experience what I was experiencing because it was, it was hell and really miserable to live in that state. So how old, so you were 25 when you yeah. moved out here and your car was stolen. And then when was that turning point? When was that epiphany? It was about six months later. So okay. I was, I mean, it kind of like revved up over three months and then I was in it pretty severe for three months. And then, you know, it's funny when you're not really funny, but it's amazing how you don't even, I didn't realize what was happening. Like I didn't, it didn't even dawn on me that I had a problem for a very long time you're just so consumed by the disorder that, you know, it's, I don't have a problem. And so just having that realization that night that I was killing myself and that this was not normal and this wasn't healthy really was um, eye opening for me. So then when you had that realization and you made the commitment to heal yourself, was mm -hmm. it just like, like a light switch was flipped and it was easy and everything. No, better. <laughs> because like what you said, I was the same. I didn't, I had so much shame. And this is really one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about serving this population is because there is so much shame and stigma and secrecy around eating disorders. Mm -hmm. The stat is only one in 10 people will actually seek professional help. And the rest of us are suffering silently and alone. And part of that is because I tend to find there's this perfectionism and we really care about the facade and the way that people perceive us. And I certainly could not admit that I had a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had my shit together is what I wanted people to think. And I was working in the health industry and I just felt like a hypocrite to even be able to say I'm struggling. And the few times I went to two therapists and I felt so invalidated by them um, I felt like they didn't understand me. And I remember one woman saying, cause I would lie. I would say, I haven't done it in a few weeks. Like I'm, I'm better now. And she mm -hmm. said, well, then why are you here? And I thought, well, I guess I don't need to be here, you know? So I would use that as a reason to not need help. And I took it upon myself to heal myself, but that I think I, I took the long road if you will, you know, versus seeking support from people who really knew what they were talking about. Um, I kind of prolonged my suffering in that way. Yeah. I mean, I think that can be really hard though. Like I, when I was in the depths of, um, of disordered eating, you know, I was in a very controlling relationship that was not, mm -hmm. um, 
that I, I felt like I was trapped in and my yeah. dad was sick and dying and my mom was really depressed and there were all of these factors in my life that I couldn't control things yeah. that I couldn't control. And yeah. I was very, um, I was, you know, 20 years old and had this obsession with if my body is perfect, if mm -hmm. my body looks really good, then everything else will be okay. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and so the interesting thing that happened was I remember actually going to a psychiatrist to talk about um, my panic attacks because mm -hmm. I was having panic attacks and I was having, you know, anxiety. And um, I was 5'7 and 105 pounds. And when I look at photos now, to me, I'm like, I looked very sick. Like mm -hmm. it's pretty clear <laughs> to me that there was a problem. You know yep. what I mean? But at the time I was uh, not acknowledging that. And I remember going to the psychiatrist and, you know, granted, this is like, I went to a psychiatrist instead of going to a therapist. And perhaps it would have been different if I went to a therapist. I think I had to go to the therapist to get the referral. I don't know how that happened, but yeah. I ended up in the psychiatrist and you know, they sat there and kind of blank stared while I said, I'm having these panic attacks and I'm, you know, hysterically crying and I'm upset. And they said, okay. And they wrote a prescription for, um, lorazepam and an antidepressant right. and was basically like, there you go. And there was this, you know, for somebody who has addictive behavior patterns in the first place and then yep. restrictive eating patterns, and then you go and you're given pharmaceuticals to deal with it. Yeah. It's a very dangerous path because I was very happy to get those pharmaceuticals and like some of them I crushed up and snorted and the others uh -huh. I took in really just in the same way that I would take food, right? In this really imbalanced way of here, let me over medicate myself so that I don't feel so that things are in this blanket of, you know, perceived control. Um, and I think it can be hard, like you're saying, because if you are lying about what's going on or even just withholding information and not, not whether it's through lack of self-awareness or whether it's through like willfully obstructing, but if you're not willing to talk about what's really going on, then it's very difficult to actually get help. Completely. Um, and, and often I find we lie to ourselves the most because mm -hmm. the story I would tell myself is this is going to be the last time I don't have a problem because I'm never going to do this again. Like tomorrow will be the first day of me never binging or purging again. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I would use that as an excuse to go binge and purge one more time because I convinced myself that was going to be it. And I can't tell you how many times I had that conversation with myself. And then that fueled some self-loathing because I, I was like, I can't trust myself. I'm lying to myself. I break my word all the time. And so there's a lot of self-hatred that can accompany um, the disordered eating when you're trying to do it yourself and you feel like you're failing. What was the, what, as you've worked through a lot of your own healing and you've started to observe like the behavior pattern or kind of the trajectory that was leading to binging and purging, what were the triggers? Like what was happening mm -hmm. that then made you feel like, was it a reward for yourself that I'm going to get to eat all of this food? Or like, what was the, what was kind of the internal narrative or like yeah. the internal process that would get you into the cycle? That's a really good question. Initially, it was completely unconscious, right? And I think you mentioned this in that it, it developed as an automatic behavior. And it usually starts much earlier in childhood. I didn't realize that I used to soothe with food a lot as a, mm -hmm, as a mm -hmm. child. Yeah, me too. And so the sort of theory for binge eating is that if you have a very sensitive child who grew up in an invalidating environment, doesn't mean it was bad, but you got the message that you were potentially wrong for crying, you know, don't cry or um, you shouldn't be angry or it's okay. You don't need you know. to feel that way. Right. So for a child, that's very confusing. You don't know what to do with your emotions. So the next time you feel it and it doesn't feel good, but you were told not to cry. So you're seeking, you know, something to make you feel better and we have easy access to food. Mm -hmm. So very quickly that becomes a learned automatic behavior. So then fast forward to as an adult, one of the most, the biggest sort of triggers to developing binge eating is going to be the restriction, 
because it's going to activate this artificial scarcity and your brain, which is designed to keep you alive and for survival will kick in and start to send signals for you to eat more and more because it's afraid that you've entered a famine or a drought mm -hmm. and you don't have enough. Mm -hmm. So if you have, if, if you find yourself on a diet and or you're restricting too much of what your body needs, mm -hmm. that coupled with the emotional trigger, for me it was having my car stolen and all my belongings that could be for you the relationship right mm -hmm. but something that you just don't know how to handle emotionally because you've never learned how how to process emotions in a healthy manner that's going to set you up to really be vulnerable to develop the binging and purging mm -hmm. and some people just have a genetic predisposition to purge mm -hmm. for me what i found is the food gave me the momentary pleasure mm -hmm. Uh, I just, you feel good. It's a dopamine hit. Food. Like 100%. Here, like and then what I found is that the purge for me served one of two things. It was either a form of self-punishment mm -hmm. because I was so mad at myself for not being perfect or for screwing up, or it was a way that I would purge the pain. Mm -hmm. And what I realized over time is the purging is actually like an energetic release, mm -hmm. right? In ayahuasca, a lot of times people will purge. Mm -hmm. It's a way to release a lot of toxins. And I find that when we have repressed pain that's accumulated over your lifetime, there comes a point when like your body just can't really handle much more. There isn't space really, and it needs to, to release it in some way. And for me, it was, it was the purge. Hmm. It's interesting. I'm, you know, I always feel like I use this show as kind of my own therapy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like I call in the people where I'm like, ah, oh, I probably really need to talk to them, ask them questions. But as I'm listening, I'm just reflecting on if somebody had ever given me a diagnosis, it would have been eating disorder, not otherwise specified, right? Because mm -hmm. it was kind yep. of all of these things. It was my own amalgamation of, you know, uh, really serious restriction, like, and I had my own group of rules, just like you did, just like so many other people did around the yep. number of calories and the times that I could eat and the types of things that I could eat and, uh, at food groups and whatnot. Yep. And then if I set one toe over the oh. line of the rules, everything had gone to hell. And yep. now it was like game on for binging, totally. right? Because I call, I call it the, what the heck effect, right? Oh, like I ruined the, the day. Yep. So like, what the heck? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then that would invariably always lead to purging because yeah. it just was unacceptable to yeah. have the food in my body. Um, and then there were rules around that too. Like it had to be exactly 28 minutes after had to, you know, and mm -hmm. I won't even say all the rules because I don't want to encourage anyone who's exactly. like, exactly. but it was like, you know, had all of these. And, and at that time, so this was a probably, how old are you now? 33. Okay. So you're a little younger than me. So it was probably a couple years before you, um, were on your path of this, but it was a time when there, and I'm sure there are still today, there were a lot of pro eating disorder mm. blog sites yep. that you could participate in. Um, and so it was very interesting because while it was sec while it was a secret and a shameful thing from anybody that I knew in the real world, I it was also glamorized this, in some ways. Right. I also had this yeah. online support community where we were all keeping track of our food intake and we were all encouraging each other mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. behaviors and using some of the words that you just said around like, oh my God, you're so good. You're so strong, right? Like praising the restriction or praising mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the purging and, and it's interesting because like that, I think fed the behavior for, a, for longer than mm -hmm. like it maybe could have for me because I felt like, yeah. um, I was really like good at it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I was like, oh, I'm like, I got like my whole secret little life yeah. over here. Well, and that's really a good point. Cause there were times when I loved my eating disorder. Yeah. I didn't want to change it. I liked it. I looked forward to it and I didn't have a problem with it. It was just. So what do you think that, what do you think that period is about? Do you think that's just about not having enough self-awareness or not having one of those scary experiences? If there's somebody listening right now, who's like, you know, they're in it and they like it and they don't want to change it. Like, 
you know, in the DSM, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, mm -hmm. there, there's a qualification that says that in order for it to be a disorder, it has to cause distress and impairment in your daily life. Right. So if somebody's out there and like, oh, it's not causing me distress or impairment, like, what do we want to say to them about like, why maybe this behavior needs to change? Yeah. If they feel like it's, it's good. They like it. And that's Helping really, them. that's really tough, Amelia. I mean, that's why they say what, you know, AA, right? First, it's, first step is admitting you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think it's a problem, it, it's hard for outside people to force you to see that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and you could list the laundry list of health consequences. Mm -hmm. So eating disorders are the most deadly mental health illness. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I had gone to the doctors for blood work because I didn't have a period. So I was trying to figure that out. And the doctor called me that night frantic. And he said, you need to get to the emergency room right now. Your potassium levels are at as high as somebody who's going to go into cardiac arrest. And I'm really concerned for you. And I shrugged my shoulders and said, eh, that's not, I'm okay. And I didn't go. And cardiac arrest is one of the, um, one of the m more dangerous yes. potential consequences, specifically Absolutely. of bulimia, right? Yep. And, yeah. So, you, okay. you, it messes up your electrolytes, dehydration. Um, you'll get irregular heartbeats. Um, I spoke to somebody recently whose friend had passed because her esophagus burst, um, mm. from it. So it's extremely dangerous, but even with that information, like sometimes when you're in the thick of it, the fear is not great enough. So, yeah. And I mean, I'm genuinely asking this because like as yeah. a therapist, like you work with this every single day and, mm -hmm. and maybe sometimes you're working with family members or other people. I, I don't know, but I kind of wonder, I remember after the fact saying to my mom, why didn't you stop me? Yeah. And she was like, I couldn't stop you. I couldn't even talk to you. Like mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. would shut me down. You would be viciously cruel or, yeah. or just chillingly cold. And like, there was no entry point. Right. Um, and to this day, as I reflect, I wonder, I wonder, is there something somebody could have said to me to shift it? Mm. And then I think about what did eventually shift, shift it. it. And it wasn't, it wasn't really anything that anybody said. Um, it was, I think, honestly, it was that I moved from California to North Carolina and like, good luck. You know, I'm not saying you can't be, right. I'm not saying you can't have disordered eating in, in the South. But, um, <laughs> it was really difficult for me to find anything to eat that fit in my rules. So yeah. then I was just like, whatever, just give me the cheese. Yeah. And then at that time, I think I shifted my pattern to just like, doing a bunch of blow instead of focusing on disordered eating. And it was just different. Right. Um, right. Right. Which is a new way to cope with the same underlying issues often. Right. Which is why it's now at 34, I'm working with a trauma therapist and yeah, not actively in disordered eating, not actively in substance abuse, not mm -hmm. actively in promiscuity um, or any of these coping mm -hmm. mechanisms. But I am just very curious about myself and about these underlying um, issues of perfectionism, yeah. desire to control, um, defensiveness, mm -hmm. um, uh, shame and feeling like I'm not, not, not okay or not good yes. enough. You know what I mean? I'm not and enough is a big one. <laughs> totally. And then the ways that those manifest now, like we yeah. can even be, we can even be better. And I'm putting that in air quotes. We can be better. We can be healthier. We can be so much more self-aware, but the underlying the underlying things are still there. It's just that we've yeah. discovered new ways of meeting them kind of face to face. And yeah. I love that you did an, um, a, a live video or an IGTV or something the other day where you were talking about uh, an unwanted emotional reaction and then you noticed that you really wanted a cookie. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the triggers are still in you. 100%. But now I have the awareness and the tools to be able to respond differently when I notice it. So I tell people now, if you struggle with binging or purging, anytime you 
catch yourself having an urge to engage in that behavior, it's always an indication that something internal has been triggered or is stirring. Now, yeah. Can what, you share with us your, your um, practice of how you figure out what's stirring? That's, and that's a great question because that's where it gets tricky. <laughs> this is why I have the work. <laughs> that's why I do the work that I do. Like, because, that's why I have a job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because from my experience, and you alluded to um, the spiritual kind of work that I've started to, to do and share, there's a few things it could be. So one is something obviously that happens in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Your boyfriend says something, pisses you off, you get triggered. Great. We can identify those pretty easily. Mm -hmm. The second is if you are like me and you're an empath, mm -hmm. sometimes what is triggering you is actually the energy and emotions you've absorbed from those around you. Mm -hmm. That used to happen with me a lot with um, clients. I'd have a really anxious or really depressed client and I'd leave from work for the day and just be like, I need to go binge. And I couldn't figure out why I was so anxious until I realized oh, this isn't even mine. These are mm -hmm. other people's energies that I've absorbed. So if you're very sensitive to other people's energies, knowing how to process and release that from your body is going to be important. The third um, is that sometimes what's getting triggered is actually memories and traumas from the past. And you said you're like doing that inner work and looking at that. Our brain our subconscious mind is so brilliant and it records every single experience we've had mm -hmm. and it records the emotions and the, you know, how we felt so that it can predict the future and keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we have memories that still have very strong emotional charges, feelings buried alive, never die. That's a great book. And it's true. We think, oh, the trauma's in the past. I moved on. I'm over that. But the reality is your brain and body, it can still very much be there and be present. Yes. So for, I mean, and just a small example is let's say growing up, you know, your parents um, were late to pick you up from school all the time. And for a kid who can't make sense of the world yet, they conclude, I must have done something to upset mom and dad. They don't love me. Now you've got some abandonment fears, right? And now as an adult, let's say um, your friend is late to dinner, right? And you're triggered by that. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily because of your friend. It's because you're flooded by all the feelings of rejection and abandonment that are still there from childhood, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times when we have an urge or impulse to binge or engage in an addictive behavior and we can't find an obvious trigger, that says to me something from the past has been triggered that you need to look at. Mm -hmm. And the technique that I use um, with clients and with myself is emotional freedom technique mm -hmm. to literally tap into the subconscious and our body's infinite intelligence and bring to the surface exactly what it is that is underlying the, the impulse and that mm -hmm. addictive behavior. Well, and you're very good at that. I'll say I, from personal experience, <laughs> I've worked with Sarah with EFT, which is tapping. And she's also guest taught for uh, one of my programs. And I had the, the privilege of being in um, a test group that you did with four sessions of tapping. And it was so illuminating for me because, you know, something that maybe feels kind of silly at first, you know, you're saying one totally out loud and then tapping and saying these affirmations. And of <laughs> course the pragmatist or the realist in me or the skeptic in me was just kind of rolling my eyes. Like this isn't going to work, but the evidence, like the, the shift in my energy and my, like the emotional charge of whatever the problem was, was so clear afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, this tapping stuff really works. Yeah. Um, and I really appreciate what you said and the very clear way that you described what happens with um, old trauma or old stories, because that's one of the things that I've discovered in this pattern that I have of uh, defensiveness in communication that only really exists in love relationships for mm -hmm. me. And that has been for, you know, 15 years with every relationship partner uh, I cannot receive, or I really struggle to receive behavioral criticism. So if somebody mm -hmm. doesn't like something that I did, or if I said or did something offensive, 
Yeah. That is not generally like a global assessment of you as a person, right? If somebody says, hey, if I say, hey, Sarah, you were late, you were, you know, you were 10 minutes right. late to this time. Could you please give me a text and let me know that you're going to be late? Um, yeah. Because that would just make me feel more comfortable. Well, that's a pretty reasonable thing to say. But yeah. if you're my husband and you say that to me, I'm not hearing this very reasonable request, could you please send a text message? I'm hearing you didn't text me. You're an asshole. You're a bad person. You're a bad right. wife. You're, you're a jerk. You're a terrible yeah. person, right? And yeah. so I respond to, to me being seen in anything less than perfection with this extreme defensiveness. And it took right. me 15 years. You know, I'm currently working through understanding that. And what I've realized is that growing up that... Um, you know, my dad cheated on my mom and left when I was almost 14. And so I have a very strong fear of being abandoned by the man in my life, right? Yes. By the husband, by the father, by this, this masculine figure. And, um, and so whenever there's anything, any behavioral criticism, I did something that you don't like, I immediately am responding to the threat of you are going to leave me. Exactly. And so I respond in extreme defensiveness, putting my hackles up. I think of myself as like a little porcupine and all the quills are out because that right. way I'm doing it right. That way, if, if you leave me, it's because I did it. And I'm in control. You yes, know what I mean? Like totally. Um, but it's so interesting because we can have self-awareness around our patterns and our patterns can still happen, right? So I feel exactly. like I want to make sure that everybody who's listening knows this isn't about questing after perfection or after, about no. like fixing it all. It's about improving the response time, improving your recovery time and creating creating new, they're still coping mechanisms. They're exactly. just healthier ones. They're just exactly. ones that aren't going to kill you. you know what yeah. I mean? like, and the, the difference is, you know, because awareness is so important. You do need to be aware of what is underlying the, the impulse or the urge or the craving or the behavior. Mm -hmm. And we do need to be aware what from our past is still affecting us in the present Mm -hmm. but awareness only takes us so far and coping skills can only take us so far. I would experience all the time. And, you know, even as a therapist in the beginning, in my journey as a therapist, I was still struggling with episodes mm -hmm. from time to time. And I was trained in all the mechanisms and I was still having a hard time. Oh, I still want to go get like legal. Speed. Yeah. Probably at least four times exactly. a year. I'll have a really strong, day where I'm just like, I just need diet pills. Like I just right. need Adderall. Like that's going to fix it. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. What do and we do with that, Sarah? <laughs> well, that's why for me, what I found is energy work has, has been a game changer because it's one thing to talk about the problem and it's another thing to literally go in and remove it. So energy work is like doing surgery. So if you think of your experiences growing up as different emotional wound wounds that are like tumors that accumulate in your body, well, if you go to the doctor and he tells you you have a tumor and explains why, great, you have awareness and he may tell you what to do to like take better care of yourself, mm -hmm. but they're not just going to send you out the door without actually removing that tumor. Mm -hmm. And so we have to energetically remove these emotional wounds so that the body can truly heal. And as you do that bit by bit, um, you'll find, this is what I experience, this is what I see in my clients, the intensity and the frequency of the urges starts to become less and less because you're removing the thing that is getting triggered to begin with. Sarah, do you think that we can um, heal ourselves or do you think that we absolutely need dialogue and community mm. in order to heal, specifically from disordered eating? That is a really good question. I think it's, I don't think you can heal yourself alone. I do think that had I not found coaches and healers to assist me in my journey and teach me the tools I now know, mm -hmm. I would still be struggling. There's so much power in, especially women coming together and healing together and you knowing you're not alone and an outsider can always point out your blind spots and it can be really hard to 
um, dive into the depths of the pain by yourself. You can't hold space for yourself sometimes to feel the depth of what needs to be felt and freed in order to heal. Mm -hmm. So having someone who can like navigate you into the, the depths of the, the pain is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think I ask because, um, like I said, you know, it, I'm just now realizing, well, for the last year, I would say I've been really actively healing for the last year that I did exactly what you said earlier in the episode, which was just kind of end the acute period of being in my, you know, negative coping mechanism and just decide I'm fine. That's all behind me it's done. So therefore it's not a problem anymore. But what I've realized is that the greatest healing that I've um, experienced has come from being witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, being witnessed has been probably the biggest thing because, you know, one of the things that I, I share with people often is like, it's not until we can show up in a hundred percent of ourselves that we can actually receive real love. Yes. Um, because if we're holding something back, then no matter how much love we're receiving, there's part of us that's saying, just like you said earlier, well, they don't really know. You know what I mean? If they really knew, then they wouldn't love me. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's only when we let people see us that then we can um, actually receive the, the love that is needed for healing or the acceptance. You know what I mean? If the yes. word love isn't jiving with you. And what I've found is parallel to the healing journey for me has been the the spiritual growth and really understanding the truth of who I am in a much greater capacity and giving myself permission to completely step into that, that power and that purpose. And I think a lot of people I work with, what I find is you're so disconnected from your soul and your intuition and your purpose. And so that also creates soul holes and people say their pilot light is out. And so you have to add kind of this spiritual quest of truly understanding who you are beyond the physical body, beyond the job that you do, because if that's what you're striving for is like you said, once I have this body, then all my problems will go away. Like if that's your focus, you will be struggling in one capacity or another for a very long time and start until you start to shift to see yourself as a soul in a body and not your body. So for the people who hear that and their eyes just start to roll out of their yeah. head, they're just like, oh, they started talking about <laughs> we, spiritual we, stuff again. <laughs> um, I, I mean, because that used to be that used to be me, and I feel like that kind of um, statement was really difficult for me to receive. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that was this sense of spiritual inadequacy, right? Yeah. That I felt like people who are on the spiritual path, or people who said they, you know, heard God, or they had a vision, or their intuition told them, or whatever, mm -hmm. like I don't have any of that. So right. either you're crazy, or you're lying, or I'm not good enough. Those are the only three possibilities because you're mm -hmm. having this profound spiritual experience, and I'm not having it. So therefore, those are the only three things it could be, right? So can you speak a little bit to? to that version of me and just explain like, what do you mean when you say get to know who you really are beyond your body and your job? Like what is this deeper sense of identity and how can we maybe get a glimpse of it if we're currently in the space of like, mm -hmm. fuck you, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that space very well. And it's funny. You said, you know, you were so skeptical about tapping me too. I was like the biggest skeptic of them all. So you know, I, I understand those people who are really um, unsure about energy work or the spirituality. For, for me, first of all, meditation was profound in me starting to get a glimpse of like the inner aspect of myself beyond physical form and start to um, just get more clarity on the things that really make me happy. I talk about what are you truly hungry for? And a hole in the soul cannot be filled with food. So usually what we're truly hungry for, like you said, to be witnessed, um, to be truly loved or accepted, to feel like we are making a contribution. Um, we're creative beings. We want to create. We, we have these passions and hobbies and things that make us feel alive and feel in flow. That's living in alignment with your soul versus living the way I should, the way other people tell me I should, the way society says I should, living out of fear, scarcity. And so 
really, even if you don't buy into a, the soul concept, but if you just start to get clear on what makes me feel alive, what gives me true satisfaction and pleasure, and how can I start to live and make choices that bring me more and more of those experiences on a daily basis, I think you're going to start to notice that internal shift. I think that's so good. And as you were speaking, one of the visions that kind of, one of the visions I had, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but was just this idea of like, yeah, even if you don't love the word God or source or spirit or any of that, if you just look at nature and you just look at living, living things, right? All living things have an impulse towards growth, right? right? We have this impulse towards to live. We have an impulse yeah. to live and to grow and to reproduce, which yeah. is the creative process, um, and eventually to decay and to die and to be transformed, right? Like this is whether you are a fish or a plant or, um, you know, any living being, like scientifically, you've got this impulse towards growth and expansion that eventually leads you, you know, through this cycle. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's really... I like that you gave the tip about meditation. And for those, you know, who struggle with the concept of meditation, we've talked about this in a ton of different shows, but just know that there are a lot of ways of meditating. It doesn't have to be just sitting and watching the breath. No. And um, I would encourage you to explore as, you know, as many different mm -hmm. modalities of meditation as it takes yeah. to get you to that place of, like you said, flow. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to ask you about today, because I think especially as we head into uh, the holiday season, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to talk about ways that you can support somebody who may be dealing with um, some of these food issues, ways that you can support yourself if you're dealing with yeah. some of these food issues. And also if you have them, maybe some like shit that is not helpful to say to somebody dealing with these issues. Like I remember sure. when I was, you know, in really struggling with restriction, when somebody would just say to me, you know, I don't get it. Why don't you just eat something? Yeah. Like, it's like, that yeah. is not helpful. You are not helping me. Like, in fact, all you're making me do is dig my heels in even more yeah. because you're reinforcing that you don't understand and I'm alone. And like, so can you share with us, like, how can we support people as we go into this holiday season or, or any time of the year? How can we be more sensitive to, to food issues and to, to being a compassionate ally or compassionate ally for ourselves. Yeah. Well, like you said, one of the things not to do is comment on somebody's weight or body or food choices. Just Period. End of At story. All. <laughs> because it doesn't matter. No matter what you say, I'm either interpreting this as, oh, I'm good because of this, or I'm bad because of this, or you're judging me because of this. And so, yeah, you look great. Have you lost weight? Right. not a compliment friend. No, it's not. And, and a lot of times that can make people either believe I need to be this way to get your approval or you didn't like me the way I was. Right. And so it, yeah, just stay away from that. Mm -hmm. And to support people, the best thing that you can do is just show unconditional love and ask them, Hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm, if you, if they're open with you, you can ask them, what can I do to support you to make sure that this is like a pleasant experience for you, that Thanksgiving goes well for you. And you guys could have a code word or a code sign if they're feeling flooded or urges, and you could know that that means we're going to go for a walk and talk about what's coming up for you. Right. So just being able to help remove a person from food and allow them a safe space to just even talk. Um, is, is really powerful. If somebody's not, like you said, I didn't want to hear what anybody had to say, then just trying to engage them in other conversation, trying to get them to go, you know, go play a game or let's do something that's fun so that we can start to spark some joy so that you don't need to get the pleasure from food. Um, or so that we don't have to, you know, if, that's your way of coping with pain, the best thing you can do is avoid drama, like avoid having family arguments and really try to keep the peace mm -hmm. so that it's just a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. And for yourself, I think what's most important is to give yourself permission, first of all, to eat the foods that you like, that Thanksgiving isn't a, 
about being perfect and it's or not Christmas. about yeah or Christmas about being <laughs> um it's not about being perfect and it's not about having to overdo it because this is the one holiday that's coming once a year that if you make the focus about time with family or connecting with the loved ones you can can really start to have more of a pleasant experience that doesn't involve the food aspect mm -hmm. and if you're if your family shows love through food um if you are a person who you know, Just most feels, families, <laughs> like, yeah, like you're going to offend somebody if you don't eat the pie or you're going right. to, you know what I mean? Your grandmother's going to be all up in your face if you don't eat a second helping of whatever. Um, do you have any boundary scripts or like help, like clear ways of being able to, it, when you're being your own ally, maybe let people know, yo, I have this code word or like, here's, you know, my way of saying politely, like, please back off about trying to get me to eat everything. Right. Um, yeah, that can be tough. The mm -hmm. food pushers out of love. We know their intention is one that's positive, but the impact can be harmful. The best thing to say is no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> like, so like a bro, true. literally a broken record. Cause you don't want to engage in a conversation about it mm -hmm. because you don't know what doors that's going to open and you don't know how they're going to respond. So, just, I mean, that's really a technique we use with kids is the broken record. No, mm -hmm. thank you. I'm good. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. I already said no. It's that's my decision. Mm -hmm. And just affirming that choice. Mm, that's good. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I I often wonder for myself, I, I have a friend, I have somebody in mind specifically who is currently in really active bulimia mm -hmm. and she came and was a house guest for a while recently and i didn't actually know how severe the problem was until she came and stayed at my house um and then i and then i knew because mm -hmm. then it was all day restriction and the story of oh i just i don't get hungry until nighttime and then I, you know, would be in my bed and hear the sounds of a lot of activity happening in the kitchen, four or five rounds of the microwave, like, mm -hmm. and then in the morning, huge quantities of food having disappeared from the house. Right. Um, and so after, you know, a few days of this, three or four days of this, I was like, I got to just talk to her about it, you know? And so because I have my own experience of, of disordered eating in the past, I don't know if the way that I did it was right or wrong. And I don't know that a label like that would even help, but I just said, Hey, um, you know, what's going on with your eating? Like, are you, I noticed that like some of the patterns that you have seem really familiar to me. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, like, are you currently like, are you currently purging? Like, are you having, yep. I just called her out. Like I yeah, just asked her. It's, um, it's good to be direct. I just asked because I was like, this is just, you know, silly. And she, she did, she said, yeah, you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. not that often, not all the time. And I was like, okay, well, maybe not all the time, but every day while you've been here, you know, by the look of it. So is it being here or is it, um, and I can't say that the conversation went anywhere productive. In fact, I think it just sent her into a shame spiral. And that was really mm -hmm. hard because I felt like, man, how do we help? Um, so I guess the last thing that I would want to ask you is like for the lay person, you know, for just, for those of us who aren't a therapist and we don't, you know, you said you have all these tools in your toolkit and you were still struggling for yourself. Right. You can have all the tools in your toolkit and you can be trying to help your clients and whether or not they can receive the help and whether or not it's their time to change is not in our hands. Right. So, but for those of us who are, who are loving someone or friends with someone, and we know that they're in, they're in a disordered eating pattern, whatever it is, um, what do you think are some, you said, love them unconditionally. Is there anything else that we can do to either support ourselves or to support them, um, to get help or to get through it? Yeah. Well, the first is to, and this is hard for most of us is to know that it's not your job to, to fix them or help them that ultimately this is their journey and their experience. And you are just, they're alongside cheering them on. And that can be really hard for us because we want to help and 
those people that we love that we see suffering. Um, but telling them like, I'm here for you when you're ready. Any, like anytime you need, please tell me like what I can do to support you. And giving them that permission is really powerful so that they know that when they're ready, they can come to you. And then you can always suggest as well, you know, I would love to, can I um, help you research some treatment options or would you be open to um, looking at some support groups in the area? I can help you, you know, see what's out there and, and help them find the professional help that's the best fit for them or most aligned with where they're at is probably the next best thing that you can do. So because we do have a lot of people who are yoga teachers or wellness mm -hmm. professionals or coaches that listen to this show, um, and for myself personally, um, at what point when you know that somebody is, that it's outside of your ability to help, um, what resource would you recommend to maybe like help them find a therapist or a support group, um, specifically mm -hmm. for bulimia or for, you know, all disordered. I think there's a, what the national eating disorder association, something like mm -hmm. that. What no. resources would you recommend people to? Yeah. So psychology today is always good to do a search in your local area of therapists and um, psychiatrists, and you can specify eating disorder and that will bring up the local people who offer individual therapy. And I like ANAD, A-N-A-D, um, which offers a lot of free support groups in the community. So you can also go on their website and see what um, support groups are located and, and when those are offered for free resources to get that group support. And there's a ton of, again, depending on where you live, you know, more intensive uh, residential programs that are available as well. And that I would either start with your insurance company to see who they're partnered with, or just do a, a Google search for uh, residential or intensive outpatient programs for the specific um, condition that you're, you're dealing with. And Sarah, when you started your own um, commitment to recovery mm -hmm. and to healing yourself. Obviously it was not, you know, one stop shop or one and done. Like it's no. healing is a way of being and we're just in that way of being now. Um, but were there any books? You mentioned one, something about feelings. We like to share a book club. So is there any books yeah. that you can recommend that you just feel like we're really eye opening for you or encouraging for you mm -hmm. or are actionable for you in terms of uh, getting better strategies for yourself or, or just feeling more supported. Yeah. Interestingly, I, the, the one book that helps me understand how my brain was functioning was called um, brain over binge. Mm -hmm. Although I don't necessarily agree with the, the treatment approaches the information about what is going on in your body and your brain was completely eye-opening and it really helps you go from what's wrong with me to understanding oh this is what's going on with me on a mm -hmm. physiological level and that that information is really helpful uh, the other book i had mentioned to you was called feelings buried alive never die which is great for helping you understand how emotions are processed and stored in the body and can affect us um, physically, mentally, emotionally. Another book that I really recommend is called um, Spirit of Anatomy, which I love because again, it, it brings in um, energy and experiences over a lifetime and how that is affecting our health and steps that you can do um, to, to heal as well. So those are a few of my favorites. Thank you. We'll link those in the show notes so you guys can go check them out. Um, Sarah, you're such a shining example of hope and just possibility um, for freedom after disordered eating. And I would just love to know if you can just speak directly to the people who are currently um, struggling and just give them some words of encouragement. What would you say? Mm, yes that it's okay, that you're okay, that you are enough and you are loved and forgiven and 
it's never too late to start to forgive yourself and start to take care of yourself because the ultimate way that we love ourselves is is through the way we care for our body and ourselves and so if you are struggling with disordered eating that's not in alignment with self-love and you deserve that so um, it is possible and it just starts with first first the choice and the decision to to start to change and it can be a long process but you can get there every choice every moment every day is a new opportunity to to try again it is you guys it is so my gosh i'm just so grateful to you thank you for taking this time and you guys if you found yourself in this story or if you um you know found that any part of this was tugging at your heartstrings and you want to dive deeper into it please go connect with sarah um, you can find her in a couple places on the web. Where can they find you on social media? Yeah, Instagram, my um, account is at Sarah Spears MFT. And they can find me on my website, which is sarahspears.com as well. And I have a so Facebook. Easy. <laughs> yeah, and I have a Facebook group I've started if you really are wanting some community support, which is just called Support for HDR. Mm. Yes. And uh, is that open to all female identifying people who are looking for support around disordered eating? Any disordered eating, yeah. Fantastic. So those are linked in the show notes below. I um, strongly encourage you guys to go follow Sarah on Instagram. She shares stuff that's super valuable and applicable, even if you're not dealing with disordered right. eating, but if you're dealing with any of this kind of uh, emotional anything, any emotional yeah. struggle. Um, <laughs> you've got really great resources and encouragement. Um, and, and also if you need to go deeper, she has some online group programs and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I believe you can do a free consultation yes. to find out about Correct. those. So we'll give you guys the info on all of that. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time. I know this is a, you know, an issue where there's a lot of stigma, a lot of shame around it. And yes. I just really appreciate you having an open conversation. And if you guys take nothing else from this conversation, please just know that first of all, you're not alone. You're not weird. There's, you know, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with you. Like nothing. this is not, you are not broken. Like there's, um, and it's, and, and you're, you're, you are supported. So like, we're here, we're cheering you on. Um, and reach out because yeah. sometimes I, just even having a conversation, if you don't have any intention of changing anything, but like yeah. a conversation can be really liberating. Yeah. And like you said, to be witness. So, you know, I would love to be able to, to be the person to hear your story and let you know that it's okay. So please do uh, connect with me and let me know how I can support you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Sarah. It was my Sarah. pleasure. Thank you, Amelia. Thank I love you. you so much. And I, I appreciate you, so. you taking the time to, to talk with me. And we'll, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me on another episode of Totally Stoked Podcast. If you love this episode, if it impacted you in some way, please grab a screenshot and share it right now to Instagram stories, tag Stoke Yogi, hashtag totally stoked podcast. Each week we'll grab one listener who shared and send you some Stoked Yogi swag. Also, if you love the show, please subscribe, share it with a friend or head over to iTunes right now and leave us an honest review. Your support and feedback make this show possible. If you have ideas about how we can improve, please send them to podcast at stokedyogi.com. Until next time, you guys, keep showing up, loving people, telling the truth, and remember, keep living your life totally stoked.